Welcome back everybody to another video lecture from Mr. Simino. Today we're going to be talking about Ionic versus covalent bonding. And I like this little picture on the front screen here. Hopefully you guys remember that ion that atoms that have lost their neutral electrons so they develop this charge. And then once they have a charge, they find that opposite charge is attract. So if you look at this little picture, you can see like they have the positive boys on the inside are attracted to the negative boys on the inside. So another one of the morning checks. So in the first part of this lecture, we're going to go ahead and talk about ionic compounds and metals. While they bond differently, they have an exchange of electrons that are occurring. And so that's what's going to make ionic compounds be able to conduct electricity when you've dissolved it in water. And we also know that metals can also conduct electricity. Just looking at this little picture here, we can see that we have something positive, we can see something negative, and we can see like a little attraction happening here between the positive and the negatives. And then this structure down here, um, we can see that we've got sodium atoms and chloride atoms or chlorine atoms here, or ions, I guess I should say. And so what ends up happening is they form this structure called a crystal lattice. Um, so if you've ever thought of like salt crystals before, that's what the basis of a salt crystal is. So to back up a little bit, we're going to talk what is a chemical bond and why do atoms form chemical bonds. So atoms are generally found in nature in combination held together by this thing called a chemical bond. It's basically a force that holds two atoms together and it's an electrical attraction between the nuclei and the valence electrons. Remember the valence electrons are those outermost electrons and they're the ones that are involved in chemical bonding, so that makes sense. And so when we talk about chemical bonds, there's two types, there's ionic and then there's covalent. But in this first lecture, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna talk about ionic bonds. Ionic bonds result from the transfer of electrons from one atom to another. So remember, if we're transferring electrons, one atom is going to become positive. The one that's receiving the electron will become negative. Because we have these opposite charges, there's going to be an attraction between the two. And so this attraction is called an, an ionic bond. Okay? And ionic compounds are composed entirely of ions. And again, between positive and negative. And then remember, positive go with the cations because they're so positive, okay? And then we have the negatively charged anions. Now, atoms are going to form these ionic bonds because they want to fulfill that octet rule. Remember, have those full valence shells. That's why they become ions. And then these opposite charges will attract each other. So, so looking, looking at this picture, picture here, here, we can, can see, see that, that we have a sodium atom. I'm hoping you guys remember that sodium atoms have one valence electron, and then we have a chlorine atom. And you guys can, if you count out the valence electrons, you can see that there's seven there. And the idea is that they want to fulfill that octet rule. So the octet rule means that they want to have full outer shells. So if this atom over here loses this electron, it will now have a full shell underneath. And if this atom over here gains another electron, its outer shell will become full, and that's what it's looking to do. So once the atoms have uh, transferred the electron from the sodium atom to the chlorine atom, you can uh, see that the sodium atom has become smaller because it's lost its shell. But notice it has eight electrons in this valence shell. This one over here has become slightly larger because there's increased electron repulsion here, but it's happier because it has a, also eight valence electrons here. And so now each one of these will look like a noble gas. This one will look like neon because it has 10 electrons. This one will look like argon, another noble gas, because it has 18 electrons. And so now they're gonna be very stable. So again, why do these ionic compounds form? They're forming because the octet rule says that you want to acquire a full valence shell of electrons, and you can do that by gaining or losing. And next, we'll talk about covalent, about sharing, but right now we're talking about gaining or losing electrons to have a full valence shell. Another important aspect about this video, it's pretty interesting. We take sodium metal, which is really reactive. We'll, we will watch a video in class about how like sodium um, lights on fire when you put it in water. We have chlorine, it's a gas that can kill you, but when they combine, the properties of each elements change because they've combined with each other to form something that we'll probably put on our dinner tonight. So this isn't gonna be an important concept. 
we are going to need to distinguish between ionic compounds and co covalent compounds. And the easiest way to do that is to look at the chemical formula. When we talk about ionic compounds, they're going to be made up between metals and a non-metal, such as chlorine. So if we look here, we'd have sodium. It's definitely in the metal category. And then when it bonds with chlorine over here in the non-metal category, that's going to be considered an ionic bond. If we looked at another one, um, such as potassium, will form with iodine. Uh, strontium could form with fluorine. I'm hoping you guys are noticing that we're taking a metal and we're combining it with a non-metal. And the stronger the ionic bond will be, the further apart on the periodic table they are. So now that we know how to identify an ionic compound, it's going to be made up of a metal and a non-metal, and we know why they form because of the octet rule where they're wanting to become stable atoms, and those opposite attractions form, making that ionic bond. We want to talk about some of the properties of ionic compounds. So there is a really strong attraction between ions and they form this crystal lattice that I had talked about a minute ago. But if you notice this, one chlorine atom is bonded to like several other sodium atoms here. One chlorine, uh, sorry, one sodium is bonded to these chlorines. So there's lots and lots of bonds going on here. So one of the things that this does is it produces this crystalline effect. So anytime you see something that has a crystal-like structure, like maybe in geoscience, then you know that's gonna be made up of an ionic compound. So here's that term that I just talked about, crystal lattices. So you have those positive and negative charges surrounding each other, forming strong bonds. And this kind of reminds me of those tinker toys when you were kids. See all these bonds that are happening? So that tells you that the structure is very strong, so it's going to be difficult to break this apart. Some other properties of ionic compounds that you need to know is that anytime we have a compound, it's going to have a neutral charge to it. They're also going to have high melting points because they have so many bonds, it's going to take a lot of energy to break all of those bonds, so that's why they have higher than covalent melting points. They're considered to be hard and strong, again, because they have all of those attractive forces, all of those bonds. And then we should know that these guys are electrolytes. So when you dissolve them in water, they're going to conduct electricity. Hopefully you remember from a lab earlier this year where we did the um, took the... Uh, electrical conductivity meters and we plop them in the water and sugar which is a covalent compound did not conduct electricity but salts did and so that's why it's because it's an electrolyte like in your sports drinks okay now we're going to get into the nitty-gritty and talk about how to write these formulas for ionic compounds it's actually pretty easy the subscripts down here are looking a little bit funky so i'm going to try to write with my finger like some other ones that you can see Okay, so there's two types of um, things that we want to talk about. Binary, okay, this means that it has two elements in it, okay, and then monatomic ions. So it's just a monatomic, mono means one, so like the sodium one plus here would be a monatomic ion. But when it bonds with something else, one, two, now it becomes a binary ionic compound. So the reason that these form in such a distinct way is, do you guys see this one plus charge here, which I know is really weird? and chlorine's a one minus charge. We talked about like how these atoms are developing this, and we just saw that picture. So this guy's plus one because he's losing an electron. This guy's one minus because he's gaining an electron. So they're gonna attract in this one to one ratio. Now we can have monatomic ions. It's just that single element. We can have binary ionic compounds when we have two, and we can have polyatomic. Remember, poly means many. So if we look at this one that I just wrote over here, this compound, we can see that there's lots of ions in here. There's going to be three ammonia ions, and there's going to be one phosphate ion. Oops, and I made a mistake here. This one should be a four right there. That's my bad. So we have this ammonia, three ammonium ions, and this one phosphate ion. So it's polyatomic ion here. So poly means many, but we treat each of these polyatomic ions as a single unit with a single charge, and we'll see that in class. So that's why I said this one's ammonia, this one's phosphate. There's three of these ammonias, one of these phosphates. dun ta da Here are the rules for writing these formulas. 
the first thing that we want to know is we always want to write the cation first and then the anion. I'm hoping you guys remember that the cation is the one with the positive charge, the anion is the one with the negative charge. Remember we always want to say something positive before we say something negative. So this is not good. This is the way that we would write this because the sodium has the positive charge and the chloride has the negative charge. Okay, when we write these compounds, we want to make sure that we are getting a neutral compound. This was one of our things that we talked about. We're going to have a neutral compound, which means there's going to be no overall, overall charge to it. And the thing is, is to get this, we need the simplest whole number ratio. So we don't want to be able to reduce those uh, subscripts that we see. We'll have an example of this. So in this example down here, you, you want to want to have two positive charges, two negative charges. If you were to add that up, you'd have a neutral compound. Over here, if you had three one plus charges and then one three minus charge, okay, we have to do a little math, but we're going to see that that is also going to produce a neutral compound. So that compound that I just wrote on the last slide for you, we're going to see that this ammonium here has a plus one charge, so we're going to need three of them, and this phosphate over here has a three minus charge, so that's why these guys would form a neutral compound, because there's three of these one plus charge guys plus a negative three guy, getting a neutral atom. When we go to write some formulas, they're just automatically going to cancel each other out, and that is really nice. So potassium has a plus one charge. Again, I know it's kind of written weird on the screen. Iodine has a one minus charge. So plus one, minus one, if you add those up, that's going to give you zero. Now down here, we have the magnesium. So this is a plus two charge. This is a minus two charge. If you guys were to add these up, it would give you zero or a neutral compound. Notice that there's no like charge written on either one of these, so that's indicating that it is neutral, and that's what we want when we write these formulas. So what happens when our compounds don't have opposite but equal charges? In this case, we can see that we're going to have aluminum. I've kind of rewritten it so you can see it a little bit better. Aluminum, if you look on your periodic table, it's going to have a 3 plus charge. Chlorine, or the chloride ion, will have a 1 minus charge. So clearly, if we take positive 3 and negative 1, this is not adding up to 0. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to make sure that these charges are balancing each other out. So here's a little bookkeeping method that I like to do over here. So here is aluminum and here is chlorine. Right now we have a three plus charge and a one minus charge. So clearly they're not canceling each other out. So how can I get to be three plus over here, right? That's what we wanna get is to be, sorry, we wanna be minus three over here. Right now we're only minus one because we have just this one here. But what if we added another chlorine atom? Well, then we would be minus two, so we're going to have to add another chlorine atom, and we would be minus three, and that would be giving us a negative three. So the formula for this one would actually be AlCl3, because we needed one, two, three of these atoms to balance this charge. So on this slide, we can see how we would form this aluminum chloride compound. So what we would go ahead and do is we'd write our aluminum, has its three plus charge as our aluminum ion. We would need three of those chloride ions, and then they would combine to form our aluminum chloride ion, or compound over here. A little bit of a cheater method that you could use would be the crisscross method. So the way the crisscross method would work is you would just take this and you would write it down here, okay, not the charge, but just the number, and you would take this, and you'd write it down here. So it'd be Al1 chlorine 3, but remember, I always like to joke that chemists were lazy, so we're never going to write this one. If we're writing the aluminum, we're already saying that there's at least one there, and so you can see how it's called the crisscross method, because you just simply switch those um, charges to determine the number of atoms that you would need. So on this slide here, I've rewritten them so you can see them a little bit better. But remember, aluminum's got a three plus charge, chlorine's got a minus one charge, we're switching it, we just did this on the last slide. But here's another example. We know that calcium has a two plus charge. Phosphide or phosphorus ion would have 
a three minus charge. So you're just gonna go ahead and switch them. So this three would plop down here, this two would plop down here, and now we're in the lowest whole number ratio where our charges are canceling out. Okay, so I just wanted to show you my bookkeeping method with this one down here. So if we take calcium, there's three of these guys. So three, Oops, I forgot to make them positive. Okay, so we'll have three positive charges of two. So this down here, this would give us positive six. These guys over here, there would be two of them would give us minus six. So you can see that these charges would cancel out, giving us a neutral compound. So when we write our compounds, sorry, it's getting a little messy. This is what the formula would look like. We need three calciums and two phosphoruses to have a neutral compound. Now this one's always a little bit tricky for kids, uh, is we're gonna use parentheses if we have more than one polyatomic ion that we're using. So in this example, we've seen this before, this is calcium carbonate. We can see that there's no parentheses here, right? We're just saying there's a calcium and here's a carbonate ion. The carbonate here, it has many atoms to it, so this would be called a polyatomic ion. But if we look at this example here, we can see that we have this polyatomic ion right here, but since there's three of them, we need to put the parentheses here. Because if we were to write the three like right here, we'd say that there were like 33 hydrogens and that's not what we're trying to get to. So um, each of these actually is a polyatomic ion. Um, we have three of these, so we need parentheses. We only have one of these dudes, so there's no parentheses needed. Again, we can use that crisscross rule to figure out the charges on these. So if we were to look at this one up here, we would see that it would be Al, and then we would need, hydroxide has a one minus charge, so we would need three of them to balance out the three positive over here. And again, the subscripts are looking a little weird over here, so it would be Na2SO4. So you guys can see how we just did a little crisscross here. Um, sodium has a two, I guess I should say over here, a two minus charge, so that two's coming down here. Sodium has a one. We don't really put anything after there if it's just a one, so that's how we'd write the formula. So this is a good stopping point for this video, and the next video we'll go ahead and talk about how we can name these compounds.